moment where everyone in this country is coming together to wish them well, to get them in the space safely. It's a really great day. And they are just now on Saturn Causeway. They just made that right turn onto Saturn Causeway. So to the right of the screen, that building is the Operations and Support Building 2. And on the left, it's out of view right now, is the Vehicle Assembly Building, that iconic building that processed uh, the Space Shuttle and Saturn V rocket to also. That's where that mobile transporter takes out, used to take out the Apollo Saturn V rockets and the, and the Space Shuttle. It's just uh, incredible machine. And where they're passing right now, I mean, if we were to run outside, we could wait. <laughs> uh, because we are off to the right of your screen there at the press site where you, where you see a group of media there. So from this point, there they still got about three miles to go from here. I'll see you guys later. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> you're going to go hop in. <laughs> And obviously, there it's not just Bob and Doug's Tesla. There's a number of cars in that convoy. They're being escorted by Kennedy Space Center Protective Forces and also SpaceX Security. They have a flight surgeon there with them. And we've seen just a sprinkle of folks along the way. Normally, we'd have security. a whole lot more people out here watching this. But we really appreciate you watching online and from home. Again, wherever you are at the beach, watching on your phone, your tablet, your whatever mobile device you have. We're gonna be here every step of the journey, taking you through it moment by moment. There's a cool shot with the worm on the roof. There we go. Now, the second now. place worm, yes. <laughs> the second place worm. So Leland, when I drive down this road on the way to uh, 39A, on the left, there's that area where the crawler used to, mm -hmm. used to drive. Can you tell us a little bit about the crawler? Yeah, right there you can see the, um, the the kind of the gravel where the crawler actually crushes that gravel almost into sand. It's so heavy. When the shuttle will go out and the Apollo 5, um, the Apollo Saturn 5 rocket will go out. And it's just, this thing moves at a glacial rate to get out there because it's got this huge rocket or shuttle on it. But uh, it's, I, and I had a chance to see that when my shuttle went out one day with Alan Poindexter. And it's just this an, enormous, you know, tracks and vehicle and, but you guys do it in a different way, don't you? You don't, you don't go out of the vehicle assembly building. You have your own building. Yeah, we have a hangar right there on the pad. So we just roll the rocket up the hill. You kind of do like a Soyuz where you just raise it up right, right. there from horizontal yeah. to vertical and it's, it's done. Yeah. Horizontal integration, so you don't need an enormous building in order to process the rocket and mate drag into it. And then once you pin into the pad at the very top of the hill, you raise it up vertical with the transporter or erector. And again, all these efficiencies to help us get people to space faster and safer. And uh, you know, this is going to be the future of space travel. And also the relationship between NASA and SpaceX working together as a team to get people up. And at this point, the convoy is approaching pad 39A, and they're entering what is known as the BDA, or Blast Danger Area. Now, before any pad technicians, engineers, or astronauts enter that area around the launch pad, the SpaceX and NASA teams do an internal go-no-go no go poll to make sure everything is clear. This storied launch pad, which has been the beginning point for so many firsts, is the perfect backdrop for today's historic launch that marks a new first and a new era in human spaceflight. And here's a view from our gantry near the launch complex 39A. So we've got another view of the convoy going by here. If I had to count up all the cameras we have all over the place for this, it would I'd be here all day. That's a beautiful shot right there, wow. looking at the Kennedy Space Center and Merritt Island and all of the nature around us. It's a it's a big buffer from 39A so that we can uh, be safe and launch our rockets off to space safely. Absolutely, and a lot of people don't realize this is a national wildlife refuge. I mean, I. I pass turtles on the way to my car every day. <laughs> well, when we would run from the operation, operations and checkout building, we'd have to watch out for snakes and for <laughs> alligators. And so yeah. to be really careful about the wildlife. We used to have one who lived at 39A. Oh, really? Yeah, an alligator. <laughs> well, maybe we'll see. We'll keep an eye out. <laughs> Tweet at us if you see any. Did you name him Worm? <laughs> Ooh. It's ahead of my time. <laughs> I don't know how an alligator would feel about being called worm. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And we've got a ton of you following along on social media. Uh, Lynn says, as a fellow Missourian, we're so proud of Bob. Launch America, we will be watching from the Space Coast cheering loud. And another comment, Godspeed and good luck, Astro Bankin and Astro Doug, hashtag Launch America. There you see the, the SpaceX horizontal integration facility is on the left of the screen now. We saw the, the front of it uh, from the other angle. Or I'm sorry, no, there it is. I, I was getting my buildings mixed up, so it's on the right now. Yeah, Bigger that, building. <laughs> the other is the Falcon Support Building. It's where all of our offices are. And yes, you're correct. Thank right you there. for the correction. Lord. There's our hangar. We process Falcon Heavy in there. There are other boosters in that hangar as well. And the Rocket and Dragon that is on the pad right now was put together, or rather final, uh, finally integrated inside of that hangar and then rolled out to that pad to go up vertical. And there it is. That uh, that shot really gives you a sense of the scale of the Falcon 9 rocket. Those Teslas look teeny, teeny, tiny, <laughs> uh, making their way up there. And so as they make their way up to the pad, we're going to throw it over now to Hawthorne, where Jesse and Dan are watching the action. Hi, guys. Thanks, Marie. Yeah, really cool watching the Teslas pull up, driving on the launch pad just a few feet away from the vehicle. This is awesome and getting really excited over here. And with us looking at the launch pad right now, we've had to do a number of upgrades, but not only to the launch pad, but SpaceX has also made changes to both Falcon 9 and Dragon to enable flying crew. And a key update to this latest version of Dragon is its highly reliable launch escape system that is capable of carrying crew to safety at any point during the ascent of the rocket. Another pretty key upgrade is the Dragon's new life support system. As you can imagine, flying humans requires keeping a habitable environment throughout the entire flight, and that means covering everything like providing breathing air, keeping the capsule at a safe pressure, keeping it free of contaminants, removing any carbon dioxide in the air, regulating the temperature, the humidity, all of these things, and also implementing that waste collection system aka the toilet. <laughs> that sounds pretty important. <laughs> the changes to Falcon 9 were small but extremely meaningful to meet NASA's requirements for safety for human spaceflight. And specifically, SpaceX had to prove a high degree of fault tolerance, meaning that small failures in the system would not lead to mission failure. Falcon 9 was already able to hand handle engine failure, but new emphasis was put on making sure that a failure throughout any phase of launch would not mean mission failure. And this goes all the way down to latches, control valves, electronics, wiring, and so much more. All right, well, with the astronauts now on location at Pad 39A, we're going to swing it right back. Marie, Lauren, Leland, take us through the crew making their final steps towards the Dragon spacecraft. Sure thing. So we are looking again at Launch Complex 39A. Uh, just a few seconds ago, we saw the Tesla carrying Bob and Doug pull up to the launch pad. Um, this is this is the site of so much history, you guys. This is where Apollo and Saturn V rockets uh, that launched the moon uh, took astronauts from. I mean, this 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 pad has so much history. Leland, you launched from there. What's it like seeing Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 there with the pad? Uh, with with all of the visual changes that have been made, I mean, what kind of emotions does this stir up in you? You know, when we got out of, out of our Astro van, um, we stepped out and we just looked looked up to see this vehicle, and it was it was creaking, it was groaning, it was making noises, it was getting ready for us to enter it to take us off planet. And you know, you get a chance to take a picture. Sometimes you 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 stand there, you look there, you think about all the training you've done all the preparation, and again, all the people that have helped you get there. And it's just uh, a solemn, amazing moment for all of us. And there's another amazing drone shot. Lauren, you explained this a little bit earlier about kind of how how SpaceX brings the rocket and capsule vertical. Now that we see it, can you kind of explain that again for folks who maybe miss that? Yes, of course. Uh, Dragon is actually processed a few miles down the road at uh, Area 59, or Dragonland as we like to call it. We then put it on a truck and drive it all the way to the hangar where the rocket is. And so uh, what will happen is we'll then break, we call it break over, where the, the vehicle's up vertical will turn it sideways because the rocket is being processed sideways or horizontal into the hangar, lift it, made it to Falcon 9, 
and then roll up those hangar doors and essentially pull the the vehicle uh, in the transport or erector, which is the big white trust structure that you see there. Mm -hmm. All the fluid lines, electrical lines, and everything are connected to the vehicles via the TE, transport or erector. And they basically roll it up those those rails. You can't really see them. You can kind of see them on the screen, those right. rails. Mm -hmm. uh, roll the, the entire TE rocket dragon assembly up to the very top of the pad, pin it into the pad systems, and then roll it up vertical. And we are about T minus two hours, 57 minutes, 44 seconds and counting. In just a couple of minutes, we are expecting to hear a formal announcement that the crew is at the pad. Of course, we saw them pull up in the Teslas and there they are. Uh, looks like they've already gotten out of the car and they are walking up uh, to the elevator that will carry them all the way up to the 255 foot level and then they'll have a couple of steps to get up to uh, the level where the crew access arm is. I have the ACDC song in my head as I see them walking up. <laughs> you know what I was I was kind of uh, jamming out to on my way in was uh, ZZ Top, Sharp Dressed Man. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know, that might be on my playlist. About there. <laughs> there they are, taken, taken in the sight, um, craning to see the top of the Falcon 9 rocket. It's uh, 230 feet tall if you round up, and then Crew Dragon is another 27 feet from the bottom of the trunk to the top of the nose cone. So, um, if you're when you're out there in person, it's 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 really hard to describe just how how large it is. Look at them getting excited. They're uh, they're ready to get in the vehicle, get <laughs> in the elevator, and uh, make it to the top. There's some thought he's picking up foreign object debris. Appreciate that. <laughs> They're also wearing FOD covers on their shoes, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, we want to make sure that they don't, you know, track the outside inside of Dragon when they go in. And so right before they enter the vehicle, they'll remove the FOD, the FOD covers off of their boots. You take for granted, you know, all just the little details like that, all of the thought and preparation that has mm -hmm. to go into literally every single piece of this operation. I love the makeover of Path 39A with the sleek black with the white ticking and the lines and it's a, it's a very futuristic look for this iconic um, launch pad and to think what's been there before with Mercury, Gemini, Apollo uh, shuttle and now the SpaceX Crew Dragon getting ready for a launch to the International Space Station. Rocket fuel still going through my veins. <laughs> And we feel so honored to be able to launch from here. Oh, here they are. That's a really fast elevator. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it really zips. That took them up to 255 feet in just a matter of seconds. They were moving their, their fire covers? Uh, it looks like they were just maybe checking something on his, on his boot or leg. And we should hear a call any moment that the crew has arrived at the pad as they make their way up the stairs and they're headed to the crew access arm now. There's the worm again. Popping. You know it. Meatball. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, there's a meatball on Crew Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Those white arrows you see there are essentially illuminating the way for anyone who's up there to find their way to the escape baskets in the event of an emergency that would require them to get far away from the rocket and the pad. And it's hard to tell from this angle, but there's actually a phone right here, and I can't tell if it's Bob or Doug that's using the phone right now, but Leland, can you explain the significance of that? It's the same phone that was there during the shuttle days. Yeah, it's a, you get a chance to talk to maybe friends or family that you haven't had, a, maybe couldn't come to the launch. In this case, it's quite a few people, but um, just to have that last moment to talk to someone before you get in the vehicle. It's a beautiful view. And, when, and we're watching the crew. Uh, when they're done using the phone there, we expect them to be making their way into the crew access arm. 
Um, and coming up at about T minus two hours and 35 minutes, the astronauts will ingress, or that's a word we use to describe climbing into Crew Dragon. And we saw Doug do it a couple minutes early on Wednesday. They were a little bit ahead of schedule, so that, that time could be a little bit flexible. But that's going to happen with the assistance of the suit techs, and they will get strapped into their seats. And so with that coming up, we're going to head over to Hawthorne for a preview of what's in store for the future in space travel. Jesse? Thanks, Marie. Yeah, shortly after we begin to regularly fly NASA astronauts to and from the space station, SpaceX will also begin flying private passengers to station and beyond using Dragon. That's right. NASA is enabling up to two private astronaut missions to visit the station each year, just as part of our support of economy and low Earth orbit. It's one of the many ways NASA is working to just open up access to outer space for companies to manufacture products in microgravity, for any new commercial modules in space, and really just to enable more people to be able to explore the stars firsthand. And the more people out there exploring the stars, the closer we become to becoming a multiplanetary species. Earlier, we showed you a first-hand look at where you would train if you were to fly with us on board Dragon. But now, let's take a peek inside of the spacecraft itself. intuitive to know what we need to do at any given moment in time. When I think about comfort for the astronauts, it's, it's really every aspect of how you could interact with the spaceship that comes to mind. We have three different seat sizes. We even go so far as molding the foam around the astronaut's body so that there's not any pressure points and it's just generally a pleasurable journey to space. Dragon is a spaceship that's all about safety and reliability. We designed it to be two fault tolerant, which means that any two things could fail. So I could lose a flight computer and a thruster, and I could still bring the crew back home safely. We also added a launch escape system. If anything goes wrong on a sense that the crew can get away from Falcon and get picked up safely. I've worked on Dragon since, since 2012. When I see Dragon lift off, I think I'm going to feel a buildup of emotion of eight years of working with some of the best engineers and technicians across the country that, that put their heart and mind into making this incredible moment happen for, for everybody. Right, so that was a detailed look inside Dragon. Here's a live look at two astronauts about to climb right in. If you're just now tuning in, you're watching our coverage of the mission known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. Today, SpaceX and NASA are going to be sending people into orbit on a mission to the International Space Station from U.S. soil for the first time since 2011. Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley are the NASA astronauts flying today, and you can see them right there on screen. They are just right next to their ride up to space. Yeah, very exciting. So as you can see, they have already arrived uh, at Pad 39A, where Falcon 9 will lift off from at 3.22 p.m. Eastern time today. They have ascended the tall structure already, which is next to the rocket, and it's called the fixed service structure, and also have already walked down the corridor, which is known as the crew arm, which is what they're standing in right now. That's right. And as they prepare to board Dragon, they have this one final stop that they're standing in right now, and that's the White Room. The White Room is literally just the room at the end of the crew arm that has an opening into Dragon. It is the last place on planet Earth Bob and Doug are going to be standing before they step into Dragon for their ride to the International Space Station. And the term the White Room was first used during NASA Gemini missions, where the room right before entering the spaceship was painted white. And... As you can see, we've continued this tradition with painting ours white as well. And on Wednesday, they actually started a new tradition by signing the wall in the white room. 
It's a fairly small area that has room for the crew and a few ground support members to complete cargo load at T minus 24 hours and crew ingress at T minus two hours and 35 minutes, which is coming up here shortly. And ingress is how we refer to the crew boarding dragon. Also inside the white room is a movable platform that just gets extended out to the capsule just to make that boarding process much smoother for the crew to climb into Dragon. As you might expect, it's also environmentally controlled. You can see kind of a big seal right up against the, the side hatch, and that's just done so Dragon can be open while keeping all the dust, dirt, and the Florida humidity out of the capsule, making sure it's pristine for the crew. And so that seal's going to stay in place until they begin to retract it, get the arm ready to move out of the way, and by that point, the hatch will already be closed. And the white room also has lots of tools in order to open the side hatch, complete crew ingress, and prepare for any contingencies or emergency that may be encountered. And right now, they're just in the white room. They're getting a final brief, and you can see them with a number of different pad technicians. Everybody on that team has a specific job. Some are suit specialists who are going to help Bob and Doug get connected to their seats. Some are specialists with the Dragon capsule itself and are going to be responsible for closing the hatch. And we also we typically have a photographer in there just to help kind of capture these moments as the crew gets ready. So right now, we're, we're watching, and we can see them start to line up there. We'll see Bob or Doug Hurley go in first, and so he'll be the first one through the capsule, and he's going to be ingressing. That's just our spaceflight term for entering. You're going to hear a lot of these terms throughout the next couple of days as they make their way up to orbit, ingress getting in, egress coming out. And they're also doing that final FOD check, making sure that the crew don't have any foreign object debris, dust, dirt, anything that could interfere with the systems on Dragon just before they get in. Right, as Leland and Lauren were mentioning earlier, they do have um, stuff on their suits to protect f from FOD. Um, and they have FOD covers on their boots, as they mentioned, as well as on their umbilical port on their suits. Um, and that's, that needs to be removed two before they can ingress. Minutes. The crew so has arrived at the like white room and they its should ingress have is that. in progress on schedule. Just listening to the nets and hearing those updates live. Yes, once the FOD check is complete, uh, they can enter, which is happening live on your screen right now. And as they climb into Dragon, they will buckle themselves in and attach their umbilicals to their suits. And as you can see, the suit techs are there to help them get buckled and settled into those seats. And as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. So the suits help keep them cool as well as delivers nitrox um, in case there is a suit depressurization. As we go through this, we saw Doug Hurley go in first. He's the commander for this mission. He's closest to your screen. And then Bob Bankin's just next to him, and they're going to get some assistance from these suit techs as they get in. There are four seats inside of Dragon for these missions, and they are numbered one through four. If you're looking from the perspective of the suit techs inside the hatch, going from right to left. So Doug Hurley is in seat two. That's the commander seat. And Bob Bankin is in seat three, which for Crew Dragon is the pilot seat. And obviously, we don't have anybody in seats one or four today. Crew Dragon is designed to carry four astronauts, though, on future NASA missions, and we'll see that on Crew 1, which will have three NASA astronauts and one from our partner agency, JAXA. And then directly above the crew right now, but right in front of them once their seats get rotated, are the three displays that they'll use throughout the flight. And that just gives them insight into all of Dragon's systems. It allows them to take control of the vehicle and manually fly it which we'll see them do hopefully only twice during two manual flight tests. As again, Dragon's autonomous, but they can jump in and take over if they need to. And as Dan mentioned, the displays are above them right now, but those seats will rotate back for launch position so that they can easily access those displays. So coming up next, the crew will do a comm check once they're all settled in. Uh, and that's so that they can check to make sure that they can hear mission control and then after that, their seats will be rotated into position. So let's check in with John Insprucker for the latest on the health of both of those vehicles. John, what's what's the status update today? We're at T-minus 
two hours, 43 minutes, and counting down for the launch of Falcon 9 with Dragon of the Space Station. As you see, the Dragon launch pad team has obviously arrived at the pad. They got there shortly after T-4 hours. Opened up the side hatch on Dragon. Got ready for the arrival of the astronauts. We saw the crew uh, come up the elevators, walk over and enter Dragon, and they're now getting situated inside the capsule. Now the flight team is monitoring data from Dragon. They most recently have completed a command and telemetry check of the radio frequency system on Dragon through the tracking and data relay satellite network. That looked to go well. There are no issues in work as we watch the astronauts getting situated in their seats inside the Dragon spacecraft. The Falcon 9 team is preparing for final checkouts and propellant load. Those checkouts are due to begin at T-2 hours, some 42 minutes from now, when the launch crew officially gets on console in the firing room. All systems on Falcon 9 are currently go. The range continues to be green on the uh, support side. The areas around the pad obviously clear except for the uh, folks doing the entry into the capsule. Uh, air and sea space are clear. We hear helicopter go by from time to time. The big concern is the weather forecast. Uh, we are continuing right now at a 50% probability of violation of the weather constraints. The big concerns are going to be the thick clouds, precipitation, possibility of lightning. I mentioned earlier, normally you get a strong sea breeze from the ocean that pushes inland and keeps the clouds from central Florida from building up. But today the sea breeze is fairly weak, so we expect the, the thunderstorms will get closer to the launch pad. We're also checking downrange conditions. If there's a contingency splashdown of Dragon, uh, we're looking at uh, essentially the wave heights, uh, lightning, rain along the trajectory. Right now it's marginal, but it is still go. We do expect that to improve slightly during the day. So fingers crossed there that the downrange weather looks good. But right now at T minus two hours, 41 minutes as the clock continues to count down, all systems are go for launch. All right, thanks, John I. And as we watch Bob and Doug get buckled into their seats, I'm joined once again by SpaceX's Jessica Jensen just to kind of walk through everybody what made Dragon a 21st century spacecraft. So first off, thanks for coming in today. I know you got to come in for a launch. That's always tough. Of course. Walk us through again kind of Dragon's life history. I mean, we have one in a clean room pretty soon right behind us. Walk us how we got to where we are today to have Bob and Doug climbing into that spacecraft. All right, thanks, so, John. SpaceX was founded to make life multiplanetary. That was why Elon started the company back in 2002. And, but, you know, also when he founded the company, we were a very small company for several years. And so we had to look for opportunities to, you know, hey, how do you go from being a small company to actually putting people into orbit? So when NASA came out with the need to fly cargo to and from the International Space Station, we jumped on that because we said, hey, first, not only is carrying cargo to and from the space station cool, I bet we could actually then fly people to the International Space Station. And hey, for eight years now, we've been flying cargo. Yeah. And then now we are have transitioned over into flying crew and cargo together. So that's basically been the evolution of Dragon and it's been awesome. And I know when we see Falcon 9, we get to talk a lot about reusability. Everyone is very familiar with the, the first stage coming back down and yep. how cool that looks. Dragon is also designed with some reusability. In fact, you've flown Dragon multiple times or you've flown Dragons multiple times to the space station. How does reusability factor into Dragon's life cycle? Yeah, so I'll actually talk a little bit about both because I one thing I think everyone always thinks about reusability and hey, it saves money or that's great, but reusability actually improves your reliability. So when we get Falcons back and when we get Dragons back, either after one mission or multiple mission, we can do all these detailed inspections on them. And that's super important because when you fly a vehicle, you can only have so many sensors on it. You can't put a sensor, you know, every single inch of a rocket or a spacecraft. And there's already way more than I think anybody realizes. Exactly. But so, you know, especially for rockets that wind up in the ocean, some people don't have any idea of what they actually went through. So the fact that we get all the hardware back, we were able to inspect literally every square inch of it and make small design changes that actually improve reliability for the whole fleet. 
So even though Bob and Doug are on a brand new rocket and a brand new spacecraft, that those spacecraft are actually more reliable based on the knowledge we've learned from reusability. We've walked people through a lot of the new systems on Dragon. What are just some of the cool things that are maybe beneath the surface that people don't know about with Dragon? So I think one of the coolest things is the autonomous docking system. And what that is, is it's basically we have, you know, GPS sensors on Dragon, but then we also have cameras and um, imaging sensors such as a LIDAR on basically the nose cone or the front part of Dragon as it's approaching the space station. And all these sensors are feeding data back to our flight computer to say, hey, how far away am I from the space station? What's my relative velocity to the space station? And then that feeds into the flight computer, which has algorithms writ by, written by our engineers to say, okay, based on how far away you are in your rates, here's how you fire the thrusters to most effectively get to the docking target. Um, and I think that's just super cool. Well, I mean, we're all waiting for our cars to drive ourselves to work, and for Bob and Doug, that's exactly what it's doing for them. Exactly. And what I think is so cool is the computer does this just like flawlessly. It's easy. When I tried to do it, I failed miserably. I tried to dock Dragon to the ISS three times, and I failed. Fourth time I got it. Um, and I will tell the public out there that on our website, we actually have a Dragon ISS simulator, so you yourself can try and fire the thrusters and see how well you do. Maybe I'm just a bad driver but I think the flight computer does a really good job. I think we all had fun with it. All right, well, we are just starting to hear. They're going to start up those comm checks with Bob and Doug. CDR, PLT, comm check. So let's listen in. CDR, loud and clear. PLT, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Umbilical comm check complete. Stand by for a ground station comm check. And again, we're just listening in. They're doing these comm checks, these communication checks. So Bob and Doug are going to do a series of these checkouts with the teams on the ground, both the core here in Hawthorne and the launch director out in Florida. And they're going to be doing this over Dragon to Ground. Uh, and they're also going to be doing it over the countdown net. Those are the two main loops or nets that you're going to hear going out. And they're going to be doing it through their different communications paths. We heard them do through the... Uh, TDRS or the tracking data and relay satellites. Those are those primary satellites that we're going to be used to talk to Bob and Doug throughout their flight and to send commands to Dragon. They'll also do it through ground stations. SpaceX has a worldwide network of ground uh, worldwide network of ground stations that they're able to communicate with the vehicle. And that's what we'll be using to get video inside the cabin of Bob and Doug on their flight up. So if you tuned in the other day, this is one of the first things that they do once they get inside the vehicle. And this is just to make sure all the communication systems with the Dragon spacecraft, with the suits, everything are working. They're able to talk to and hear everybody on the ground. Dragon, SpaceX, comm check, ground stations. SpaceX, Dragon, loud and clear. Core loud and clear, ground station comm check complete, stand by for teacher's comm check. Just a reminder, you're hearing the core. That's the crew operations responsible engineer. That's if you followed NASA missions in the past, that's the CAPCOM position. That is this pretty much the singular voice that's talking to the astronauts throughout their flight. And that's a position based here in Hawthorne, California. And you'll also hear Dragon, SpaceX, Comcheck, Tetris. SpaceX Dragon, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Teacher's comm check complete. Standby with comm checks with MD and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, MD on count and one. Comm check. SpaceX uh, Jason, loud and clear. Copy, loud and clear. Glad to have you guys on board. Uh, stand by for comm check on Dragon of Ground. Dragon, 
Dragon, MD, Dragon to ground, comm check. MD, Dragon, loud and clear. MD, loud and clear, stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, launch director on countdown one, comm check. Good afternoon, Mike, loud and clear. I have you the same, and good afternoon. Stand by for my comm check on Dragon to ground. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground, comm check. SpaceX Dragon, loud and clear. I have you the same. Back to core. And Dragon SpaceX, this, this concludes our launch configuration comm checks. Report when ready for seat rotation per section 2 of 4.100. Dragon, I'll put that in work. Copy. All right, so all those communications checks were done successfully, and you could even see, and it's so cool when we get these views right inside the cabin. Space next Dragon in 2.2, two, we are ready for seat rotation. Copy. We will report when initiating. But you can see Doug Hurley using his right hand. He has the talk button built into the seat itself. So just, again, showing you all of the different systems, how the suit is integrated into the seat, and it's all just one big circle for this whole spacecraft. So really cool to see those comm checks live. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for walking us through some of the really cool updates, the upgrades. Did you have any other cool stuff besides? Let's see. So I don't know if you guys can see, but we have the Dragon clean room here. And one of the coolest things is it is right on the main floor of our main building. So thousands of employees walk by here all the time and get to see Dragon in its final processing before it goes to the Cape. On Wednesday, the Crew-1 capsule was in here. It looked almost done. It looks a little empty right now, but that's because that capsule went off into our separate test facility for its final propulsion checks. So we do leak checks and things there, and we do that in a separate facility just because it's high pressure testing. Um, and then the vehicle will come back here, get its final thermal protection system put on, and then it will ship off to Cape Canaveral and get ready to launch four astronauts to the International Space Station. I mean, what's, what's it like to see it? Because when you see the first initial pressure vessel, it looks nothing like the final thing. So yeah. what's it like to just kind of watch it go through and you just see little bits get added on, added on, and then the next thing you know, it's a whole spacecraft. Yeah, I mean, that's what's, that's what's so amazing. I'm so impressed. You know, when you look at a machine, you're like, how does this ever get built? How do people ever do this? And it really is just step by step, one piece at a time. Each piece has its critical function, and you get to watch that being built right in front of your eyes every day when you Dragon go to work. Dragon SpaceX, we are ready to initiate seat rotation. Dragon copies. Dragon SpaceX, Dragon SpaceX, Dragon SpaceX, Dragon SpaceX. And we just heard the seat rotations about to begin. So, Jessica, thank you so much. Cool facts about Dragon for everyone to listen in on and we can see the seats start to rotate now pretty soon bob and doug will be in their launch configuration and they'll be ready to go and we can see the seats slowly start to rotate again they're in this down position just to make it easier to climb in and out of dragon they'll rotate to this launch position to put their backs a little bit more parallel to the ground it, makes taking the g-force a little bit easier for the crew on the way uphill but most importantly positions those touch screens directly in front of them which is just their gateway into dragon dragon spacex seats are in the launch position we copy all right in confirmation the seats are in the launch position let's go down now to gary in mission control houston where i know the entire jsc team is standing by and ready to see dragon take flight today over to you gary Thanks, Dan, very much so. Great to see good comm checks from Bob and Doug and that their seats have been rotated into their uh, launch position. Here in Houston, Flight Director Zeb Scoville has pulled Space Station flight controllers, and all systems are go for launch from the Space Station side of things. Essentially, the station is prepared for Dragon to arrive 19 hour hours after launch. Chris Cassidy has completed his preparations uh, for Bob and Doug to arrive. He's got a chance to view some of the broadcasts and even said they were, quote, looking sharp. Flight controllers here will monitor the countdown, but really it's up to the teams in Kennedy and Hawthorne to get us to lift off at this point. So we want to hear your comments as we continue to count down to launch. So let's go to the social desk now, Tahira. 
Thanks, Gary. So glad to hear that polls are go, at least on your end, and just hoping this weather just works out good for today's launch. I mean, people online are on the edge of their seats. We just checked numbers, and we're up to 1.1 million viewers right now. That's almost double when we checked last time. And right now, we also have Columbia, South Carolina is leading the viewership, so interesting to see how that changes. Let's take a broader look at the conversation online with this heat map of the United States. Now, this shows Launch America mentions by state over the past week, and we have California leading right now with the most mentions, and I'm very surprised. I really thought the Space Coast would take it home, but let's see how this changes over the course of the broadcast. And with that, let's see what y'all are posting online right now. Guys, I mean, check out these outfits. Absolutely love it. Um, love to just see how people are making things creative for this launch and really making it their own, putting their personal touch on it. Let's take a look at another. Oh, we are back to the Launch America heat mentions, so let's see how that changes over the course of this broadcast. But really fun to see those photos online. Oh, we have another space pet, guys. These do not get old, so please use hashtag launch America on social media. Right now, it looks like we have Catstronaut Boris, who is ready for his launch in the Crew Dragon capsule. I just, I love seeing the pet owners unite for this mission. So like I said, definitely use that hashtag. We will be looking for it during the show. Marie, what's the latest at Kennedy? Thanks to Hero, we are at T minus two hours, 26 minutes, 47 seconds and counting from liftoff of the Falcon 9 from the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida, carrying NASA astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Behnken. You see them right now aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft. It's been a very exciting day so far. The crew has been up since about 8 o'clock this morning as they prepare to head to the International Space Station as part of this Demo 2 mission for NASA. And as we speak, the astronauts, as you saw, are inside Dragon and, are, and have completed their comm checks. So now they can communicate with the teams here on the ground. And their seats have rotated upright uh, to their reclined launch positions, allowing them to see and access the display panel. And now they are about to they initiate their, their own suit leak checks to make sure that their seat is in proper working condition before liftoff. And in just a little bit, at about T minus one hour, 55 minutes, it could happen a little bit sooner though, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, um, we will see the closeout team begin to close the side hatch in preparation for flight. And that's going to be one of the key visual milestones on the timeline to lift off. Now, we want to take you to a couple of special guests we have joining us. They are with Daryl Nail at the OSB2 viewing location, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein, and also, Kennedy Space Center Director Bob Cabana is there with Daryl. Hi, Daryl. Hi, Marie. That's right. We're in the uh, fifth floor of the Operations and Support Building here at the Kennedy Space Center with a nice view of Launch Complex 39. And the two men that you mentioned are here to join me to answer a few questions. We're excited to have them both here. And they are, of course, Bob Cabana, the Director of the Kennedy Space Center, and Jim Bridenstine, Administrator for NASA. Gentlemen, thanks again for making the time to be here. Uh, of course, the big story right now, Jim, is the weather. So let's talk a little bit about that. We, we can see there's some clouds building. That was forecast. You took part uh, in a weather briefing this morning. Uh, what do you know about the weather and, and, and the decision that was made to say, hey, let's, let's give this another shot today? Yeah, so what got us last time was the electricity in the atmosphere. And of course, today there are, in fact, buildups. It doesn't look like there are thunderstorms at this time, but they are expected. Um, the question is, when do those thunderstorms go away? And when those thunderstorms materialize, where are they located? Um, we are predicting about a 50-50 uh, shot uh, of going this time. Um, but given the fact that we are in late May in Florida, um, we have to take every shot we can get. So um, it's not likely that uh, in, in a couple of days it's going to be any better than it is today. So we're, we're, we are a go for launch right now. Um, and we are hoping that the weather will hold up. We almost made it on Wednesday. Um, and the trend is better today than it was on Wednesday. So we'll see. And I saw a forecast that said the clearing is supposed to happen right around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So That's right. we're hoping that that launches is at 322. Right. Clearing you know, at the earliest 3 o'clock, at the latest 3.30. So depending on when that happens, uh, we'll, we'll either be go or no go. But um, again, 
uh, we're going to take every shot we've got. Also watching the downrange weather for a That's potential right. rescue in case there were an abort. That's right. So, you know, we have these staging areas. When we go from the first stage to the second stage, that's a higher risk evolution. We want to make sure that in the case we have to exercise the launch abort at that point, that the weather is good. And, of course, that's off the coast of, of North Carolina. The big thing there is... It's great that we have a launch abort capability. The challenge is that launch abort capability includes parachutes. And with parachutes, you've got to make sure that you've got the weather to come down. If there are thunderstorms or downbursts or high winds, uh, that's problematic for the parachute system. Right. And sea states as well, bouncing that exactly. capsule around in the ocean. Uh, Bob, of course, you're an astronaut. Uh, you know what it's like to hit the reset button and do it all over again. Get into the spacecraft, get ready to go, only to be told, no, we're not going to go today. We're going to try it again. What, what's that like? And then, and then, tell me about the mindset as you have to kind of reset. Is there? Do you feel less anxious? You, you feel more comfortable the second time around? You know, Daryl. Uh, first off, my last flight we counted down to 18 seconds and didn't go. Man, and when you get to 18 seconds, you're ready. Yeah. The key is, you know, it's the training that we go through, all the repetition that we do. We practice everything, including scrubs. And uh, just because you uh, didn't launch doesn't mean you don't have something to do. So you got to go through those back out procedures it's all done very professionally then it was out of the vehicle and into the astro van back to crew quarters and it, we had a positive attitude we got a good night's rest and we went through it again it's just it's a matter of doing your job and these guys are well prepared you know it's all part of uh, what we do yeah, they, they stopped the count at 17 minutes, but you had it all in <laughs> just a few seconds. It's a big difference. And, and the truth is, the next night, actually, everything went really better. You know, the weather was bad the first time. I was kind of glad we scrubbed. And we scrubbed for a, an issue with the vehicle that they later sorted out. As it turned out, we wouldn't have had enough prop to rendezvous with the, the Russian car functional cargo block. But, <clears throat> you know, the next night, it was just a, a perfectly smooth launch count. Everything just went like clockwork, and uh, it set the stage for an awesome mission. I think you told the press before you walked out, uh, I think you were over there at Astronaut Crew Quarters, we're going today. I, I'm wondering uh, where's the source of that confidence coming from? I, I just got a feeling, you know, you got to have a positive yeah. attitude. I, you know, I, I watched a lot of weather down here uh, supporting shuttle missions, and I'm hoping that those clouds over the I-95 corridor, that the Indian River keeps them west of, uh, west of us, and that stuff that's building offshore is far enough off that we can stay, stay in an open window here at the Cape. Good. Well, we got your positive vibe going, and we appreciate that. Um, Jim, when you were uh, down in the astronaut uh, crew quarters and uh, when they were suiting up, you got a second chance to visit with the astronauts. Kind of yeah. tell us about that and, and what was their demeanor, what was their mood today? So, uh, again, they seem loose. They were loose last time, they're loose this time. They're definitely ready to go, they're excited. Um, they've been wanting to go for a long time now. Um, yeah, what was, I'll tell you, one thing that I thought was a little interesting is. Um, you know, Bob Bankin was making fun of Doug Hurley because on, on Doug's last flight, um, they scrubbed five times before launching on the sixth time. So Bob Bankin seems to think that Doug Hurley is the problem in this, <laughs> in this case. But to see them joking about that as they're getting suited up, ready to go, um, yes, they're, 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 they're trained, they're ready, but they're also loose. Um, and that's good to see because, um, because, because they're, they're going to have to be on their game, game when, when, when we launch. launch. These, These guys, guys are, are, are pretty, pretty impressive. Um, Doug, Doug Hurley, Hurley and Bob Bacon. Bacon. I mean, Doug, Doug Hurley, Hurley, an incredible pilot. Uh, Bob Bacon, he's, Bacon. he's got, got a, a, a PhD, PhD in mechanical, mechanical engineering. And he's a flight, flight test, test engineer himself in the Air Force. Air Force yeah. Yeah. Well, well, in, in your, in your assessment, assessment, why are these, these guys, guys the right stuff? stuff? Well, this, well, this is, is a test, test flight, flight. Um, and, 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 and you know, we, got, we, have, we have great astronauts, astronauts that, that are, you know, chemists, chemists. We, have we have great astronauts that, that um, are botanists, we have really talented and diverse, very, very diverse astronaut corps in general, but this, this is, is a test, test flight, and for a test, test flight, what do you want? You want test pilots, you want people that, um, for a living, they have made a living flying new things that have never been flown before, and, you know, Bob Bank and Doug Hurley are the two people that you would want um, in a test, test flight, and that's exactly what this is. Bob, you're, you're a pilot, pilot too. You want to weigh in on Doug, Doug Hurley. Hurley. He, he seems, seems like, like uh, you know, he's, he's, he's got, got the right mentality. Right mentality. Well, what can he's, I say? he's a customer. He's, he's a new leader, a marine pilot, pilot, a test pilot. pilot. Uh, he's he's all, I'm all in. He's, he's a great guy. guy. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and tell, tell me a little bit about, um, in terms of the Kennedy Space Center, right? So you've been here since 2007, right? 2008. 2008, sorry, off by one year. 2011, the Atlantis came to a wheel stop. Um, yeah, I, grew I grew up here. here. Uh, uh, my, my dad worked for NASA. NASA. My, my uncle was a contractor. contractor. When, when that, that wheel stop happened, the next day, 
my, my uncle, uncle got, got the layoff, layoff notice, notice, right? And in 30, 30, 60, 60 days, it, it was depressing. depressing. We're talking about thousands of people laid off. Super depressing. Atlantis landed, landed on a Thursday and Friday. 2,000 contractors got pink slips and walked out the door. Yet they worked on that vehicle. That was the best vehicle we ever flew. The cleanest. That's the dedication of the workforce here. Right. So take me back to that time. You called it a depressing time. You know, the fact that the shuttle program was something that the government completely uh, had ownership of and paid for. Now we're moving into this commercial crew, which you've overseen making that transition. And tell me about that nine years in which we made that move. Well, obviously, everybody was really attached to the shuttle. I mean, it was our history for 30 years. It did an awesome job. The Hubble Space Telescope, all the satellites it deployed, building the International Space Station. But um, when I first got here, I told, I told everybody, everybody the shuttle, shuttle program's going to end. We, got, we have, have to start preparing for our future. And, and, and nobody wanted that, to hear that. that. But, but how many times in your life do you get to define what you want your future to be? And, and we set out on this bold goal of trying to turn KSC into a multi-user spaceport, supporting both government and commercial operations. And uh, I've got a very persistent team. They worked extremely hard. And through a number of agreements, you know, we were able to make it happen. And this is the future. Commercial spaceflight, you know, the administrator says, it all the time. We, we want to establish a, a commercial environment in lower Earth orbit so that we can focus on the hard job of exploring beyond our own planet to establish that presence in our solar system beyond planet Earth, establish a sustained presence on the moon, get to Mars, establish a presence there. We can't do that if we're locked here in lower Earth orbit. And commercial crew with both SpaceX and Boeing, that's the beginning of a whole new era of spaceflight. All right, very, very good. good. Um, quick, quick question. We've got, of course, a special guest coming uh, back today. The President of the United States plans on being here. Um, Jim, you took him around the first time around. How did that go? I, I think I saw a picture on Twitter. He signed some space hardware. That's right. So, uh, so he took a look at the Orion crew capsule. Of course, uh, the Orion for Artemis 1 is ready to go. Um, and he signed uh, you know, a piece of hardware that will fly on the crew capsule for Artemis 2. Um, so, so that's, that's kind, kind of, and, and not just him, but the, the first lady and the vice president, president and the second lady, they all signed it. So, um, so their names are going to fly around the moon on Artemis II, which is exciting. But I just want to give uh, Colonel Cabana a compliment here, because he did bring this spaceport through a very difficult time. And now it is a, a multi-use spaceport, and we do have commercial, and we have, in fact, even international launches here, and now we're going to have commercial crew launches. Uh, Bob has done a wonderful job transforming this spaceport. That's why we're doing commercial crew. NASA wants to be one customer of many customers. We, we, we want to have numerous providers that are competing on cost, innovation, safety, driving down costs, increasing access. But even better today, uh, when, when I, I took this, this job just uh, a few short years, years ago, you know, our budget at NASA was around $19 billion. The budget request that President Trump gave us for next year is $25 billion. We are in a great, great position because the President is committed to space exploration. Of course, he's committed to the Space Force. We haven't had this much support for space since John F. Kennedy. And we've got bipartisan support. Everybody wants to see the Artemis program be successful. Everybody wants to see not just the next man, but the first woman on the moon. And that's what we're building here. The key to it all is that bipartisan support, and of course, um, what the work that Bob's been doing here, you see the commercial activity all around this place. Um, we're going to get to some questions on social media real quick that uh, our, uh, you know, our audience wants to find out. So the first question is from James on Twitter, and he asks, what is the hardest part of going to space? We're going to have to give that question to Bob. You know, nothing's hard if you prepare for it. And uh, what we are afraid of is, is stuff we don't have knowledge about. And that's what we do when we learn how to be astronauts. We train, okay? You spend a long time as an astronaut candidate learning. You spend a long time preparing for a mission, for an International Space Station mission, training around the world on all the different uh, modules and everything. You know, it's like two and a half years of training before you get on orbit for that uh, time to actually do your work. So I have to say the hardest part is the preparation for it. But, but you are so prepared when you go. You just have total confidence. You know that you are very well trained for what you're going to do. You have an outstanding team on the ground supporting you. And that is so important to have that ground support as you uh, climb into that vehicle. You know that they've done their very best to ensure your safety and, uh, and a successful mission. But uh, after that, it's a piece of cake. Except no simulator on Earth can 
prepare you for what those guys are going to feel. It's, it's better, better than, than a cat shot, shot on your head. I believe it. Maybe, Maybe one day I'll get, get to try. try. The commercialization effort means we want everybody to be able to fly into space. space. Absolutely. It's a great point about preparation, preparation because that's, that's not the highly visible part. The launch is. And so it's good to know that uh, all that preparation leads to that confidence. Uh, by, by the way, just an update to operationally. They're uh, getting ready to close the hatch door. You can see uh, on your screen there the, uh, the workers there are uh, getting ready to get that closed and uh, working, on, uh, working on that right there with uh, Doug, uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Bacon on the inside of Crew Dragon. Our next question is from Mathis on Twitter, and he asks, what kind of operations will the astronauts do between the liftoff and docking with the International Space Station? I know you pay a lot of attention, Jim, to the operations, uh, especially this mission. What do you know about that? So there's a number of things. The first thing that they have to do is, of course, we've got a number of burns to get in phase with the International Space Station. We've got um, some boost burns as well. We're talking about you know operating the rocket engine to, to get in alignment with the space station. But I'll tell you, the biggest thing that we need the astronauts to do once they get on orbit and before they dock is rest. We need them to eat. We need them to rest. We need them to be prepared for that docking. Uh, once they are in range of the International Space Station, um, they're, they're going to start maneuvering the spacecraft themselves. Not automatic, but they're going to do it themselves. They are, in fact, test pilots. And as test pilots, they will test fly this vehicle to make sure that it operates as advertised. And, of course, then they will dock with the International Space Station. And a unique capability here is it's automatic rendezvous and automatic docking. And so um, we're going to be able to see that for the first time as well. That's going to be exciting to see. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Jim, Jim Reinstein, Administrator of NASA, Bob Cabana, Cabana Director of Kennedy Space Center, thank you both for joining us. And, and we're going to send it back to Marie in the studio. All right, thanks, thanks a lot, Daryl and, and Mr. Reinstein and Mr. Cabana for joining us. us. Um, you, you can, can see, see some clouds starting to gather over Launch Complex 39A. We're keeping a close eye on weather again. 50-50% chance of launching today. We just got to see what the weather's going to do. Um, a little bit ago, we heard the crew complete uh, their comm checks live on the air. We saw their seats rotate. That helps get them into a little bit more comfortable position for the G-forces during launch. And more importantly, it helps them be in a better position um, to interact with the screen screens in front of them. They completed their suit leak checks. Um, we saw during the interview just a few minutes ago the hatch uh, begin to close and so inside the white room there the pad closeout team is in there um, still doing some work. That, that hatch closes, you know, it's not as simple as just closing a car door. There's a process um, to seal it and check it and make sure that uh, everything is sealed properly. Right, Lauren? Yeah, that's correct. <clears throat> if they haven't already started, uh, one thing that will be coming up next is the leak check. Uh, what they'll do is they'll attach a, uh, a piece of the ground support equipment. They don't have it in their hands right now, so um, it looks like it hasn't started yet. Ah, there it is. You can see it there. Uh, the uh, closeout member number five is already attached to the side hatch mechanism. And what they'll do is um, they're essentially checking for the leak rate. And uh, they'll hold pressure there for a few minutes and then track that change in pressure over time to make sure that it's within bounds, making sure that you don't have any issues with those O-rings there that are holding that pressure. And so once they complete that leak check, they will then do what is the, uh, called the installation of, or the final installation of the SPEP, or Side Pressure Equalization Plug. That's basically a, a plug that um, once, once the capsule splashes, splashes down, what you'll, you'll do is um, actually remove that, and what it does is equalize the pressure across the hatch. So once that thing is plugged in, you know that everything is, is super tight, and that you shouldn't have any leaks on orbit. One of the other things that I think is pretty cool about Dragon, you can kind of see them uh, on the edges there or some of the windows. I, I know that Dragon started out as car it was cargo Dragon. You have your cargo version, and before you moved on to the crew Dragon version, but you even had windows on the cargo version. Can you explain kind of why that was? Yeah, the very first cargo Dragon that we ever had, that we ever launched, um, had a window over the hatch, over the side hatch. And the reason we did that is we always envisioned Dragon to ultimately be a crewed vehicle. So even in the beginning for the first, the very first vehicle we ever made, which carried, didn't even really carry much cargo, um, 
we, we put, put that, that window there, there and it, it to us symbolizes what Dragon's purpose has been all along, you know, taking, taking those steps, starting off with the, uh, the CRS program and resupplying the, the space station with, with experiments and, and food and crew provisions uh, for the astronauts on board to now putting our own astronauts, or putting NASA's astronauts in our own vehicle. Um, it's that natural progression of what we're aiming for the whole time. And, and Leland, what's, what's your take, take on the touchscreen touch technology? We, we saw a little bit about that, obviously. This, this is a very different kind of look um, than what we saw during Space Shuttle. shuttle. We know it's the future. I mean, we had our, our LCD displays, and we had lots of buttons to press, and, you know, files and switches. And I think this, this new technology will allow us to get through procedures much more fast, you know, much, much, much faster. Because we had, you know, paper flight data file that we're having to turn to different pages and get to things. And I think this will make it much more efficient to go through your malfunctions and your procedures with the touch screens. And I think, you know, having the gloves, being able to, you know, touch the screens and work within the gloves. Um, everything's kind of sleek and efficient, you know, there's not a lot of wires and things hanging off, and there are any boards, you can see there are any boards on the left knees, so that's for some extra balloons and things. There's some commentary. We are ready for the closing grass briefing when you're ready to copy. And we just heard confirmation on the loose that the hatch is closed, so that is a little bit ahead of schedule. We are motivated to go today. <laughs> okay, on the weather, uh, we still have some rain showers moving through the area, uh, but we do have a reasonable opportunity today, so we are proceeding into the counts. Uh, we are going to take a look at both pad and ascent track weather at T minus one hour and 30 minutes, and the next decision point will be prior to prop loads. Okay, we copy. And on the vehicle front, both F9 and Dragon also remain nominal uh, with no items of note. So we just heard the weather is still iffy. Good news, thank you. The weather is still iffy. We conclude the post ingress brief. Uh, report when ready for contract with the top nine operators. We are ready for the uh, F-9 operation. Copy. Expect that shortly. So when we hear that chatter pick back up, we're going to quiet right down so that you can listen into that along with us. But we just heard them discussing the weather briefly, still keeping an eye on that, but the next decision point is going to be uh, before prop load. So we're going to press forward for now and then reevaluate on before they start fueling the rocket. But in the meantime, it sounds like Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon are healthy, so um, the vehicle's in good shape, right? It sounds like kind of a little bit of a repeat from Wednesday that we're just keeping an eye on the weather at this point. You can see on their left legs, well, in that previous image. Dragon SpaceX contract with that nine, uh, you can expect it in about one to two minutes. Dragon ready. All right, on their left legs there, they have the satchels that are strapped to their legs. Inside are some group provisions, including these tablets that you see uh, that they have displayed there. You say along those are tablets versus just new boards that you can write on? Uh, or the tablets are inside. Oh, they're inside. Yes. Okay. Okay. And so when would they pull those tablets out to use them? Uh, during the mission. Okay. Wow. Well, yeah, while well, in orbit. Okay. And I don't know if it's coming, if this, the background noise is coming through over the air, but we hear the rain really picking up outside the studio here, so I'm kind of wondering if Bob and Doug are hearing the sounds of the rain clouds opening up over the pad. It looks like they're, it's still kind of patchy out there, but again, we were following some thunderstorms that looked like they may be making their way over here. It, it kind of looks like it's raining from that view. It's, kind of, it's a little bit hard to tell through the haze. All right, launch, launch is now uh, just over two hours away. 
to hear you are there with the social teams now that the hatch is closed and the rain's picking up and all kinds of exciting things are going on right now as we count down and get into the last two hours of the count i bet things are getting pretty interesting on social media Hey, Lauren. I mean, yes, they are. So many different things are going on right now, and I think people online are just wondering what's going to happen with today's mission. I have TweetDeck open right now, and it is just scrolling with the conversation of people around the nation talking about today's launch attempt. We also just checked viewership, and we are now up to 1.4 million people watching this live broadcast, so really hope things look good with weather. And on that note, let's take a look at some of the things being said on Twitter right now. So it looks like, oh, we just have some more future astronauts. I really love seeing the young generation just getting mobilized, getting excited about today's mission. Looks like we've also got some Godspeed and safe travels for both astronauts today. Um, really do wish them the best of luck on the second attempt. Hope it happens. Some throwback photos all from people visiting NASA centers. And also just let's do this. I love this can-do attitude. And I just love seeing that people are still keeping the energy alive for today's launch. So there were obviously some disappointing reactions to Wednesday's scrub. But let's take a look at how people are getting excited for today's attempt. Let's roll. One of the great challenges in this world is knowing enough about a subject to think you're right. Up to the launch. The NASA team really took, you know, a strong look at all of the pros and cons of all the different ways to do that time. When she gets inside, it looks like she's got a spacesuit on. So she loves it. <laughs> That's the inspiration for that next generation of explorers. They're going to take Doug and Bob's place one day. And uh, I think we have some people out there that are so interested in our conversation about the worm and the meatball that they've created something called the worm ball. What? <laughs> yeah, I saw. I was checking my email during that because you're like, I emailed you guys the worm ball. And I was like, what is this? I, I don't. I'm having a hard time seeing it. But what is the worm ball? So it's a, it's a NASA meatball, which is, you know, what it should be. Yes, yes. Okay, look at okay. it. There it is. All right, thank you. I need yeah. a visual. So they okay. took the, the angular NASA logo and put in the worm inside of the meatball. Can you can you live with that, Lauren? You know what? That's a beautiful compromise. I'll take it. I'll take it. it. <laughs> it's a nice marriage of the two. Oh, I love you, man. Yeah, so, truth. truth. And uh, there is another live look at Launch Complex 39A, and we have had the opportunity to share with you a lot about the SpaceX Crew Dragon sitting on top of Falcon 9, a lot about the crew themselves, and the significance of today as the official return, we hope, of human launch capability to American shores. But we would be remiss if we did not explain why this pad, 39A, is happening hallowed ground. We're go, same time, we're go. Many of NASA's storied missions began their daring journey from the exact same spot on Earth. Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. This massive structure of steel and concrete has cradled rockets and guided each on their final descent to space for over 50 years. There can be no launch without a launch pad, 
and this hallowed ground has a history greater than any other. Having evolved and been reshaped for each new era of space flight, it's alive with a heartbeat as strong as the first. Launchpad 39A came to life under the direction of project engineer Harry May as NASA ramped up its efforts to achieve an unprecedented calling. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? In 1962, Earth-moving machines sculpted its massive pyramid base to a height of 40 feet. Then, concrete was poured to hold it in place. To launch the world's first moon rocket, engineers cut a flame trench nearly the length of two football fields down the middle of the mound. It was in line with heat-resistant bricks to deflect seven and a half million pounds of earth-rattling thrust, first felt on Apollo 8. Less than a year later, Apollo 11 launched from Pad 39A. And hundreds of millions of people around the world watched as it landed on the moon three days later. Nearly a decade after this Apollo era, 39A again took center stage with a new, one-of-a-kind spacecraft, the Space Shuttle. Millions of pounds of additional steel for service structures transformed the look, but not the purpose, human spaceflight. In all, 82 space shuttles blasted off from 39A until the very last start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. All three engines up and burning. 2, 1, 0, and liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis. On the shoulders of the space shuttle, America will continue the dream. Roger roll, Atlantis. With the fleet retired, demolition crews removed the shuttle-era hardware to clear the way for NASA's monumental decision to lease this historic launch site to the private company SpaceX. Today, its sleek and modern design supports a family of rockets that has advanced the commercial age of American spaceflight. Now, 50 years after it first sent humans to the moon, this historic spaceport stands ready for the next wave of human exploration. And we're looking live again at Pad 39A. We're looking at the Pad Closeout team. You can um, identify them by their numbers there. And we heard confirmation of the hatch uh, being closed just a few minutes ago. So again, things a little bit ahead of schedule. And when I say ahead of schedule, I don't mean the launch time is changing. I just mean um, some of the specific milestones in the timeline. Those times are a little bit flexible, but that launch window remains instantaneous at 3:22 this afternoon. Um, and Leland, you know, we just saw a piece about the history of pad 39a all stations, all stations chief engineer and countdown one for comm check with the crew we're going to pause for that comm check falcon 9 guidance navigation and control dragon gnc on countdown one comm check gnc dragon we have you loud and clear gnc loud and clear stand by for comm check by the propulsion engineer Dragon prop on countdown one, comm check. Prop, dragon, loud and clear. Prop, loud and clear, stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one, comm check. Avionics, dragon, loud and clear. Avionics, loud and clear, stand by for comm check by ground segment engineer. Dragon ground segment on countdown one, comm check. Ground segment, dragon, loud and clear. Ground segment, loud and clear, stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control and countdown one, comm check. 
Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Countdown 1, comm check. Chief Engineer, Dragon, we got you loud and clear, Bala. Chief Engineer, loud and clear, this completes the Falcon 9 Responsible Engineer comm check. And we just saw a thumbs up from Doug Hurley. We listened to a series of comms, comms checks there, and so um, everything... Dragon, Chief Engineer on Dragon to Ground. Loud and clear on Dragon to Ground. Uh, loud and clear. Well, good luck, and let's see if the rain clears up. That sentiment is shared by all here. Do it. Copy that. So Bob and Doug, along with the launch teams and all of the rest of America, hoping the rain clears up here. Uh, but as far as comp checks go, um, everything uh, sounded pretty normal, pretty nominal there. Uh, so we're just waiting on the weather to clear up. Um, but again, there's a live look at Launch Complex 39A, the site of 82 space shuttle uh, missions where they began. And of course, Apollo, uh, the first mission to the moon, Apollo 11 lifted off from 39A. And Leland, you were just five years old old when that happened take yeah. us back there we we're and lauren i was five and i was the antenna engineer during the broadcast i was the kid <laughs> standing behind the black and white sylvania television holding the rabbit ears and my dad said move to the left move to the right <laughs> and i was trying to look around the television to see what was going on but i they said no no, no don't move stay there <laughs> <laughs> so i never actually saw the actual you know landing on the moon neil and buzz walking on the moon and the next day all the friends my friends in my community were like yeah you want to be an astronaut we just had this momentous thing and i said no <laughs> <laughs> i didn't see it i want to be arthur ash because arthur ash trained five blocks down the street from where i grew up and my dad talked about his, his excellence his perseverance his, his athleticism and so it wasn't until i got to nasa uh, working as an engineer at NASA Langley that a friend of mine said, you'd be a great astronaut. And I'm, I just laughed at him. And I didn't fill the application out, but another friend of mine got in, Charlie Camarda. And I said, if he can become an astronaut, I can become <laughs> uh -huh. one. So I applied the next year and I got in, in the 1998 class. And I think about this, again, storied legacy, Pat 39A. I was uh, there in 2008 and 2009, Space Shuttle Atlantis, the last one that came in with Doug and the rest of the crew. And it's just a, an amazing time to see this new era with Lauren, with your SpaceX Crew Dragon about to take off. I never heard that story. That's I've got a million what? stories. <laughs> a million <laughs> stories. <laughs> wow. It's it's so cool that you know you do have a lot of these kids that are watching today who have never seen mm -hmm. a, a flight, a human space flight mm -hmm. uh, from KSC before, and um, this is their first time. And I'm trying to remember back. You know, I, I grew up in the shuttle era, and I grew up in Los Angeles. And I remember sometimes when the shuttle would land at Edwards Air Force Base, mm -hmm. you'd hear those sonic booms. Double and sonic booms. You boom, hear boom. the double sonic booms yeah. in school, and and we all just knew. Oh, that's the space shuttle. It was just right. a thing. We right. just knew about that and it did make me sad that there's a like an entire generation of, of kids who didn't grow up with that experience and mm -hmm. I'm just so proud that you know today hopefully we get to provide that for kids and hopefully have more and more of these launches to the point where it becomes routine hopefully never right. boring but routine and yeah. there's talent in every zip code so you have to make sure that every kid is has the opportunity to do these types of things if they believe in themselves and we give them the right tools that they can use to be in stem fields and you know we have a very diverse group of people up mm -hmm. here working together to get bob and doug off safely and i think more people that see this type of diversity will have a chance to say i can do that too Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, we have a lot of kids watching today, and we have an opportunity to hear from another really awesome role model, especially for the little girls in the audience. So we want to throw it over to Gary in Houston to talk to a very special astronaut standing by there. Hi, Gary. 
Hi, Marie. I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by one of NASA's record-setting astronauts and a recent resident aboard the space station, Christina Cook. Christina, thank you for joining us. It's great to be with you today. Christina, we're coming up on 20 years of continuous human presence on the International Space Station, and you were one of those humans. What's it like to see a new milestone like this launch unfold after so much history already? You're right. So much history indeed, and it's just been great to watch it all unfold. I think for me, the most exciting thing is how NASA is not only innovating in what we do, ex you know, exploring the universe, pushing the boundaries, getting knowledge on the space station, bringing it back to Earth for benefits here, but in how we do it. We're innovating in the implementation of the, those goals and of our mission. And what that means is that bringing in the private sector, bringing in a commercial space economy for low Earth orbit means space is going to be more accessible and more innovative. Innovative, and it's just an awesome new year. Years make it so easy to live on board the space station. Sometimes you forget you're actually surrounded by such a hostile environment. So uh, remaining vigilant both day to day to have that appreciation then that you wake up with every day, and then also being vigilant, knowing that things could take a turn for the worse at any time, and you have to be ready to react to that. So um, it's a great privilege, but it also comes with great responsibility. You came to NASA after the days of the shuttle program and you flew on the Russian Soyuz. What does it mean to have this private capability to fly astronauts to the station? Well, I think it's just a great innovation in terms of our partnerships. You know, when we started out, it was individual countries pursuing the space exploration. We brought in the international aspect of it, and now we're really folding in that commercial aspect, bringing the innovation of all of our American industrial power and recognizing that the more partnerships we have, the more accessible, the more innovative space exploration can be. So it's an awesome time, and it brings with it so much more capability into the program as well. So it's not only how we're doing it, but it's what it brings. We're looking forward to having this transportation from private companies. How does it help you do your job in space? You know, I think uh, what one concept that we have in NASA for safety and to mitigate risk is called dissimilar redundancy. And here now we're bringing up a whole second way of getting crew to the International Space Station and getting cargo, last minute cargo. So we're increasing how much science we can do on board the space station by twofold. We're increasing how we can, you know, our options for getting items up, stowage items, um, supplies, provisions, science experiments. So we're really just banking on the extra redundancy to make the program that much more robust. We're watching Bob and Doug go through the final phases of preparing for this launch. What's going through your mind so close to liftoff? Oh, it is such a great day indeed. You know, it's interesting because I think it's not so much what is going through your mind, but what's not going through your mind. You know, you're not thinking about all the things could go wrong. You're thinking about enabling success by doing what you've been trained to do. One of the sayings we have is that on launch day, astronauts are sometimes the most calm people in the room. And I found that to be true on my launch day too. I think it's kind of this career culmination of everything you've learned, everything you've dreamed of, and you know that it's coming together in that day and that you're going to finally do what you're prepared to do, execute the mission, and it just really brings a sense of calm and readiness. NASA astronaut Christina Cook, always an honor to hear from you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Well, once Bob and Doug arrive at the station, NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy will be ready to welcome them on board. So in anticipation of their launch, he had this message for them. Hello, everyone. I'm astronaut Chris Cassidy, commander of Expedition 63 on board the International Space Station, flying 250 miles above the Earth. Like you, I'm excited about today's launch and the possibilities it will bring to America and to the world. But also, I'm very excited that two close friends will be arriving and joining the crew. I had the privilege of flying with Doug Hurley on both of our first shuttle missions back in 2009. Together, we came to the International Space Station and helped construct the amazing facility that it is today. Although this will be my first mission with Bob, it was my honor to follow him as the chief of the office when he left back in 2015 to begin training for this amazing mission. Personally, I've been very fortunate to fly in two different spacecraft. Launching from America on the shuttle, and most recently launching from Kazakhstan in the Soyuz. But I can't tell you how exciting it is to know that we're once again launching Americans from the coast of Florida. And finally, here's a story I'd like to share with you. 
Back in 1981, John Young and Bob Crippen launched on Space Shuttle Columbia, the very first space shuttle flight, marking the last time we flew Americans on a brand new vehicle. With them, they flew an American flag, representing America's technical prowess. Thirty years later, that same flag was flown to the International Space Station. This flag remains here today, waiting for Bob and Doug. Our flag means so many things to our country, and this small piece of America represents what we'll be able to achieve together. We'll never stop exploring. And so Bob and Doug can take this very special flag home to Earth, where it awaits its next journey to the cosmos. In a few years, the Burst Orion crew will take this flag with it around the moon. All of this starts today. I'll be watching outside the window, along with everyone else in America and around the world. I can't wait to look out the window and see my friends on close approach. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and go Bob and Doug. I'll see you soon. And there again is a live look at Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we are T minus one hour, 41 minutes, 58 seconds and counting from liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket carrying Crew Dragon with astronauts Bob, Bank Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley strapped inside. Uh, we can see some raindrops on the screen there. Um, it looks like rain coming down at the pad, but we're still uh, monitoring weather and it sounds like there's going to be another decision point before they start fueling uh, the Falcon Falcon 9 rocket, which is scheduled to happen at about T minus 35 minutes. So uh, we just heard a little bit about where they're headed. Uh, if the weather cooperates today to the International Space Station, Leland, you've been there twice. And I know um, just from what you've told us, it's, it's this Leviathan in space and <laughs> the site of so much important work and partnerships happening. Right. Chris Cassidy is up there floating in the Columbus Laboratory that I installed, or our team of us installed um, on STS-122. And I think about, you know, using this robotic arm that was made in Canada, the European Space Agency built the Columbus Laboratory, and my job was to use that arm and attach it to the International Space Station. And as it was getting closer and closer, the motion just stopped. And I'm like, what is going on? And there are four ready to latch indicators that have a very slight spring force that I was moving so slowly with the hand controller, the translational hand controller, that that, that spring force stalled out the motion. And Peggy Whitson was behind me and she Go said, ahead, Leland, there's some commentary. Weather update, I think. Go ahead, sir. Hey, Doug, we're still waiting for a weather update expected at 18 Zulu. Uh, therefore, the next assessment will be closer to the propellant load time. Uh, we are currently no-go in launch weather, but we are showing an expected clear of 1830 Zulu. Okay, copy all. Thanks for the update. So we just heard if, if they were to launch right now, the weather would be no-go. However, it sounds like there may be an opportunity um, if the weather clears, as it sounds like they expect it may. So again, we're going we're gonna to keep listening um, as we continue talking. If we start to hear any kind of chatter, especially if it's about the weather, we're going to do our best to quiet down so that we don't step on that and, and everyone can hear it along with us. Uh, but Leland, you were just talking about uh, the work on station and and. Peggy Whitson was getting ready to tell you something. <laughs> well, so the Columbus Laboratory is stalled out. It's about to be attached. And there are 10,000 people waiting. Their job security depended on me installing this thing properly. Right. And Peggy said, Leland, push just a little bit harder on the hand <laughs> controller. And all four ready-to-latch indicators went green. And I was like, yes! And that was our primary mission objective. But that paled in comparison to what happened next. Peggy invited us over to dinner in the Russian segment. And we had this meal with people from all over the world, Russian, German, French, African-American, Asian-American, this diversity that we talked about earlier, were up there breaking bread at 17,500 miles per hour while listening to Sade's Smooth Operator. <laughs> it blew my mind. It was Smooth yeah. Operator, right? You what know? an appropriate song for the job, too, right? Wow, and, does she know? 
<laughs> she <laughs> knows oh, now. Yeah. <laughs> and Dan Tani actually changed the song to from Smooth Operator to Arm Operator. Uh-huh. So Arm you see operator. Arm Operator. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. And Leland, you actually, uh, we were in an, another taped segment when you got a text uh, from yeah. Drew Foistel. Can you can you share that with us? Yeah, Drew Foistel, his good friend, just sent me a text saying that uh, the families say hello to all who are watching and thank the nation and the world for their support and interest. And Chris Ferguson just actually sent me a text. He was the commander on STS-135 and one of my classmates from the 1998 class. And he says, way to go, Scott Speed on Crew Dragon. That's awesome. It, it's great to, to hear those words of support. Thank you guys for watching and everybody following along at home. I mean, uh, the the COVID-19 situation has been just a just a tough time for people stuck inside, um, homeschooling their kids, still trying to do their jobs. And so it's yeah. it's really cool to be able to uh, to watch this happening. And we see the pad closeout team uh, it looks like they are getting ready or they, like they've left the, the white room and they've already come down the crew access arm. So they are getting ready to leave the pad now. And we are going to go now to uh, the Operations and Support Building 2, where Daryl Nail is standing by with NASA's Chief of Staff to talk to us a little bit about some of NASA's ambitions uh, beyond the International Space Station and its work with the Commercial Crew Program. Daryl? Yeah, that's right. We're here in the, the Mission Briefing Room at uh, the top of Operations and Support Building here, where there's a lot of important people that are gathering to watch the launch here. And one of those people is not me, by the way. One of those people that is important is Gabe Sherman. NASA's Chief of Staff, we appreciate you being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Daryl. You got kind of the insight of what's coming down the sure. pike here at, at NASA. So, so, of course, today is commercial crew, and we're focused on that, and seeding the commercial market. But what's off in the horizon for NASA? Well, I'll just tell you, it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting time to be at NASA, and you know this. I mean, you're here every day. Uh, but whenever you think about what we're doing with commercial crew, uh, you know, in the horizon uh, in July, we're launching Mars Perseverance, which is just going to be an incredible, incredible thing for us. You look at the end of this year, you know, SLS, the largest rocket in the world, is, is going through testing right now, going through green run testing. And, and we're hoping maybe by the end of the year we can even get it right out here to the Cape, mm. um, which would be a, just an incredible achievement for our team. So um, there is no shortage of things to be excited about at NASA right now. And it feels like everything is really starting to happen been here recently with everything that you just mentioned and if we get that first Artemis launch that could be right around the corner as well. Oh man you know we're looking at uh, I think late 2021 is what we're looking for um, and so you, you think about SLS potentially moving through from the green run to the Cape um, you've got Orion finishing up its last little bit of testing. It moved from Plumbrook um, earlier this year, our, our, our station up there in Ohio, down to KSC. So we're looking at uh, checking it out throughout next year. And hopefully we'll have the first integrated flight of SLS and Orion at the end of 2021. And I'm telling you, that, that is going to be a moment. That will be exciting. Yeah. And there will be a thunderous boom right here at the yes. Kennedy Space Center. Um, so with Mars as the end goal, mm -hmm. how, how, do, how does all of this get to that end point? You bet. No, and I think that's what's so important about the Artemis program, right? Our, our long-term vision is to get to Mars, but you know, when you think about Artemis, everything that we're doing at the moon is helping us learn, prove out capabilities and technologies, work through the, the right mission durations, understand how we utilize the resources of the moon potentially to go further onto Mars, so the technology, the science, the exploration, um, architecture that we're putting together, each and every piece of it is helping us learn a little bit more, prove out a little bit more so we can take that next giant leap to Mars. And so everything that we're doing at the moon helps prepare us to move on to Mars. How about the activity in low Earth orbit, like commercial crew, which is happening uh, today? Yeah. How does that help us for missions to the moon? Yeah, well, I think anytime you're launching humans, you're learning, right? And you're taking what you've learned and you're you're moving it forward to the next to the next mission. But I think it's really about the business case. If you think about what commercial crew is, it's NASA moving from owning and operating hardware to buying a service, right? And if you remember, just a few weeks ago. Um, and we awarded three contracts on the human landing system to commercial companies. And so we're hoping that we move to a day where we're actually buying a service to get our astronauts back and forth to the moon. Um, so actually 
enabling com the commercial market to go from the low Earth orbit all the way out to lunar orbit. And so commercial crew is a great proving ground for that, um, helps us prove out that business case, build those partnerships, and then we get a feed forward to the moon. So it's, uh, it means a lot. This means a lot as we move out. And, and it's really exciting when you talk about uh, the commercial crew, the commercial, commercial aspect going to the moon right. and those partners. Um, they're going to be studying those landers uh, to see if they are viable for NASA? Yeah, working through a, a tremendous process of with, with the commercial providers and NASA engineers going through initial designs right now, looking at, at the, the capabilities that they've proposed, and then trying to make decisions on which, which landing system goes early in 20 2024, which landing systems are better prepared for sustainability out in the, the later 20s. And so that is going to be an ongoing process throughout this year and moving into next. Um, so it's going to be really exciting to kind of see what, what comes out as, hey, this is the lander that's going to take the first woman and the next man to the moon in 2024. Right, so different than the time of Apollo when we right. went to the moon, yeah. and that program ultimately came to an end. Right. Uh, the idea here, though, is to try to create some sustainability. Talk right. about that. Right, and sustainability, y you can get to sustainability if you have reusability, right? And that's, that's what we're seeing with commercial crew, for sure. Um, but whenever you think about our human landing system, um, you're, you're looking at a system that we put out there at the moon once we get to sustainability, and it's going back and forth, taking multiple trips to the lunar surface, back up to Gateway, which um, you're familiar with this kind of our, our smaller space station we're going to put in orbit around the moon. Um, so we're, we are building an architecture that is going to enable reusability at the moon. Apollo never had that. And so whenever you think about driving down cost and increasing access, reusability, sustainability are critical. So you get to see everything from a very high level at NASA. What's it right. like for you personally, I'm curious, to be here at the Kennedy Space Center uh, to watch a launch and, and to just see this amazing facility where all of this activity happens? Yeah. I think sometimes um, people think since I work at NASA, I'm around this stuff all the time. I'm not, right? I don't get to come down here nearly as often as I'd like. So it's just as exciting for me as it is for anybody else in this room. When you think about all the hard work that our team has put in to get us to this day, um, to actually come down and be a part of it with them, um, it's just in a, just, it's just and NASA's Chief of Staff, we appreciate you joining us today and enjoy the launch. I, I certainly know you will if we were able to get that one off. We're going to toss this back now to Hawthorne, California. Joining us now is SpaceX's Lars Blackmore to discuss SpaceX's future ambitions to visit the Moon and Mars. Thanks for joining us again today for a second round. You're welcome. Could you tell us just a little bit about your background and what you do here at, space, at SpaceX? Yeah, well, uh, I'm in charge of entry and landing for Starship, which is uh, SpaceX's next rocket uh -huh. after Falcon 9. Uh, mm -hmm. And before that, I worked for many years on the same thing uh, for Falcon. Um, so hopefully today you'll see another one of those landings on a drone ship. Awesome. And speaking of that, what role does reusability play uh, in getting people to the Moon and Mars in the future? Well, it's really all about making human space flight affordable. And what you want for that is a 100% reusable rocket. Yeah. Now, Falcon is only partially reusable, but goal. Starship is going to be 100% reusable. It's and we've actually already started working with NASA oh, on really? using Starship to send astronauts to the surface of the moon for the first time since 1972. Not only that, Starship will be refuelable on orbit, and the combination of those two things will let us send people basically anywhere in the solar system with more payload for less money than I think people have really been contemplating. I think for the first time, we can seriously talk about things like lunar bases, or what SpaceX cares about most, a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. Right, so what you're saying is I will have an opportunity soon to get on board one of those spaceships. I, I very much <laughs> hope so. Yeah. So speaking of reusability and landing, um, I, I know you mentioned Starship will be refuelable uh, in orbit, but Falcon does come back and land back on Earth. What, what are the challenges with landing, actually landing on the moon and landing on uh, a planet like Mars? Yeah, well, you, you can't land like a plane because the Moon and the Mars either have no atmosphere or have a very thin atmosphere. And, and even if you could, there's no runway that someone's built for you. So that's one of the reasons that we do propulsive landing on Falcon, because we want to figure out how to do propulsive landing. That fundamental architecture works on basically any planet. If you have no atmosphere like the Moon, you do a propulsive landing burn all the way. If you have a thick atmosphere like Earth, 
you let the atmosphere slow you down as you float down and do a short landing burn at the end. And for Mars, which has an atmosphere but a very thin one, you do something in between the two. Wow. Yeah, that sounds really difficult. Um, and I'm sure there has been a lot of effort put into that. Um, can you tell us anything about um, what we're working on now to get us to a point where we can do a landing like that in such a harsh environment? Yeah, so figuring out propulsive landing is really the key part of it. But what people may not realize is that every time we bring Falcon back, we do something called an entry burn. So just mm -hmm. before we hit the atmosphere, we light the engines to slow the rocket down. Mm -hmm. That happens high up where the air is very thin. And it just so happens that the conditions there are very similar to what a Mars landing burn would look like. So even though it takes months to get to Mars, and you can only do it every two years when the planets line up, we effectively get to practice Mars propulsive landing every time we bring Falcon back, including hopefully today. Wow. And as you mentioned, every time we bring Falcon back, we learn something new. Can you tell us a little bit more about what we learn uh, after the, the vehicle has returned and we're able to check out the vehicle? Yeah. So uh, Jessica actually mentioned this earlier that, you know, I, I talked about how cost is really one benefit of reusability, but reliability is the other benefit. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine that you do all this planning to send a rocket up through the rigors of launch and re-entry, but you don't get to see the rocket afterwards. Um, and what, what we would like to do with the reusability, what we've been able to do with Falcon 9, is see the rocket, inspect it, and because of that, we've been able to correlate our models pre-flight to what actually happens when you launch, re-enter, and land a rocket. Right, instead of just guessing what happened to the exactly. vehicle after it's left. Exactly. That, that is amazing. Well, thank you again for joining us today for You're a second welcome. round. Hopefully the weather works with us today in a couple hours, actually. Um, let's throw it back to KSC with Marie. All right, actually, we have Lauren here. Now, today's mission opens up the door to one day allowing the general public to be able to visit places like the moon and Mars. And as you've heard through uh, several interviews today, reusability is a really, really important part of that. Imagine if every time you flew a plane from LA to New York, you threw it away at the end of the flight. That would mean essentially airline travel would be too expensive, costing hundreds of millions of dollars a flight, and almost no one would be able to fly. And so that's what SpaceX is trying to do here with reuse, allowing um, not just a handful of people to be able to go to space, but tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of regular folks like you and me to be able to, to go to space. So, you know, for myself, you know, when people like me have a chance to go, I know my dream is to land on Jupiter's moon Europa. Uh, scientists believe that there is a liquid water ocean underneath the ice and that it has the potential to be habitable. And so I'm super excited to get up close and personal to maybe some space fish. <laughs> uh, Leland, what about you? Where would you go? Wow, that's a pretty interesting destination. Um, I think I would like to go to Mars. We've, we've studied Mars so much and looked at it, and I think maybe having a Martian base that is dog-friendly you know, bring the pups along. Yes. Because I think as we explore, we want to take our families, our cultures, our traditions, you know, with us. And, and you know, flying with Doug and Bob is cool, but, you know, having more people. Yeah. There's See? the dogs. The puppers. Taking the, the puppers to space. I mean, you know, they, they're not. <laughs> they look ready to go. They too. are ready to go. <laughs> we just needed some, maybe some like SpaceX type suits for them, <laughs> you know. But it's, it's, uh, it's, that's what it's all about, exploration. Like the settlers going the West, you know, they mm -hmm. took everything with them and they started these new communities and these new new traditions. And I think that's what we do with space travel. We start new traditions and communities and bring everyone together as one one family, one civilization. Absolutely. We're here for it. And knowing that the opportunity to fly to space as a private citizen is really just right around the corner, we have a new poll question on Twitter for you. If given the opportunity to fly to the moon, now we're talking the moon, would you fly to the South Pole where no one has ever been, or would you go to the Apollo 11 landing site? So those are going to be some interesting answers. 
And while there is not a ton of cargo on today's mission, Dragon is carrying two very special payloads, aside from Bob and Doug, of course. The first of those payloads is a series of custom art pieces entitled Humankind by Los Angeles artist Christian Tristan Eaton. These indestructible double-sided paintings made from gold, brass, and aluminum celebrate how far humanity has come, as well as how far we still have to go. It includes a beautiful homage to the Saturn V rocket, as well as a nod to Bob and Doug's current ride to space. And you can find more images and information about these pieces on SpaceX's social channels. Next, in the spirit of inspiring the next generation of explorers, we wanted to celebrate the class of 2020, from kindergarten all the way to graduate school. So SpaceX and NASA invited students from around the world to submit their photo to fly on America's first human space flight in nearly a decade. Each graduate's photo was used to create a mosaic image of our beautiful planet Earth, which we printed and it's now being flown aboard Bob and Doug's flight on the Crew Dragon spacecraft. We received nearly 100,000 photos. That's a ton, so thank you, and congratulations, graduates. Yeah, I've got a couple of family members and friends who submitted their photos, oh, wow. so they're super <laughs> excited about seeing their faces go to space in that beautiful mosaic. That that's was really great. cool. And again, that's what it's all about, you know, everyone coming together with their experiences and bringing them forward to, to space. And, I, you know, I think regular people flying to space. I mean, we're, SpaceX is gonna be flying, you know, non-government people, non-military people, but people that have a desire to explore and do new things and traditions off planet, as we say sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if- all this time since we've had the International Space Station, it's been government astronauts performing the research because you're the only ones we've been able to send, right? But well, we've I mean, had some tourists, though. We've had people that paid their way on a Soyuz rocket. Sure, to sure. Go. But it, it's a very, it's it's really the billionaire boys club, you know. That's what Pharrell talks about. With you know, it costs so much money to go to right. space, and I think that price point will come down as we make this more, you know, more amenable for everyday people. Absolutely. And then eventually being able to fly artists and musicians and poets, people who can tell the story of what they've seen out there in a way that really connects to the soul of people down on Earth so they feel inspired to go. Exactly. Now, following today's mission, we will be one step closer to a future where we can all have that opportunity to gain the orbital perspective and explore new worlds. In just over an hour from now, Bob and Doug will be the first people to launch on an American vehicle in almost a decade. And for the SpaceX team, if I can try to speak for all of us, which is impossible, but I will say it has been an absolute honor to have the opportunity today to have this stage to show the world what we've poured our hearts into over the years with our partners at NASA. And it's just deeply humbling to know that the agency and that Bob and Doug have entrusted us with this critical mission, the the responsibility that's on our shoulders is is huge and, and we're just so grateful to be here today absolutely and I know that you know our NASA teams really share in that sentiment um, we heard we heard from just a handful of them earlier when Bob and Doug were riding out to the launch pad but there are just there's so many people that were you know we're probably never gonna see or hear from on the public stage but that have poured their hearts and souls as you said into this mission um you know all the engineers up late hours checking double checking triple checking everything um to troubleshoot and solve problems and get us to this point so um it's it's just really awesome that we've made it to this point when you think about legacy katherine johnson who helped get john glenn to space her daughters are watching right now Mm -hmm. and that again that legacy going forward to the future of space travel yeah it's powerful wow and we heard from two icons of science and exploration on wednesday and we couldn't resist sharing these shout outs with you one more time wow we're making history again the nasa program i'm there with you guys in spirit bob doug good luck I know you'll be fine. I'll be watching and got everything crossed, arms, legs. I'm tied in a knot. Can't wait for you to get back safely. This is the first time a U.S. built rocket has taken people into space in nine years. It's quite an accomplishment. So for us at the Planetary Society, more rockets means more exploration. More people in space means more exploration. More countries involved in the endeavor of spaceflight means more exploration. 
This is how we know the cosmos and our place within it. So congratulations, SpaceX. Here's wishing your team and the crew especially a safe journey and the joy of discovery. Let's go. So great to hear from William Shatner and Bill Nye, uh, two um, very recognizable faces following along on the mission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we want to go over to Dan and Jesse and Hawthorne, where we are now just one hour and 18 minutes from launch. Dan, Jesse? Hey, thanks, Marie. Yeah, one hour, 18 minutes. I think we're tying ourselves in knots, just like Captain Kirk. We're, we're really hoping the weather cooperates. In about 20 minutes or so, we might clear. So we're getting hopeful. We're getting yes. our hopes up. Yes, yes. Very excited. Again, we're T minus one hour and 18 minutes from launch. And we are the anticipation is real over here. <laughs> Since arriving at the spacecraft, Bob and Doug were helped by our closeout engineers to get into their seats, attach their suits to special umbilicals that provide breathing air, pressurized nitrox, and a communications link to Dragon Systems. They conducted leak checks, which were successful, and communications checks with the core here in Hawthorne, which is the person who will speak to them directly throughout the mission, as well as the launch director in Florida. This is where they are checking their calm path through both ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites that we'll use to talk to the crew the entire way to the station. And after all of those suit leak checks were successful, the closeout team was able to get out of the uh, Dragon capsule and seal up that hatch, which also got its own leak check and was confirmed successful. At this point, the closeout team is out of the path. They're away from the BDA, the blast danger area, and weather operators are about to kick off their final checks on wind speeds at the pad, which are going to be used during the final go-no-go -go for launch. So we're all keeping eyes on the weather right now. Before we get to that final go-no-go, -no -go, all the various teams, both NASA and SpaceX, are 